Hello everyone, in today's video I thought we'd do something a little bit different. I've got a check ride for my private pilot coming up pretty soon, and uh, one of the things I was asked to do is to prepare a flight plan uh, between two positions. Uh, this video is probably going to be broken up into multiple parts, given the fact that there's a many, 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 many steps involved in trying to do a cross-country flight plan. So we're going to go ahead and uh, go for it anyway, so you can see the process that I use in the real world almost exactly. So it'll actually be kind of a neat little learning experience for everyone. And it'll also give me a chance to you know, keep my uh, stuff going. So the task we were given is basically to design a flight plan that's going to be traveling from Hartford Airport, which is Brainerd, all the way out to Nantucket Memorial Airport. Now, when you take a look at this flight immediately, you say, well, that's not terrible. It looks like it's a pretty darn straight line. You got a couple different waypoints along the way. We do, unfortunately, have a lot of overwater flying. So we have to actually consider new things in the real world that we would probably not normally consider. So uh, one of the things I do have at my disposal, which is I always get a kick out of, is I have this little flight plan VFR checklist, is what I like to call it. You can see all the fun things I have in here. And uh, one of the reasons I really like this checklist is it works really, really well for me. Again, there'll be a copy of this for, uh, for people up top if you want to go ahead and take a look at it later. All the critical things that I'm going to need are going to be on here. Allow me to kind of identify this part. So the first thing we want to do is uh, we don't really have a choice as far as this option goes. We need to pick a destination and make sure it is open. So now how do we determine that? We're going to figure that out by going to the airport, and we're going to just double check what the AFD for the airport says. So the AFD looks a little bit like, not that, uh, the AFD itself, uh, one of the downsides is I can't go back because the way this thing works sometimes. There's the AFD. So here's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be making sure that there's nothing on here that suggests that we can't actually fly to the airport that we're flying to. Keep in mind, we're not looking at anything like NOTAMs here. We're more interested in what kind of lighting do we have? You know, what is the orientation? I can see that there's a threshold here, and I can see this is very, very impossible to see. And there's this little rinky-dink little airport right here. Look at this runway. <laughs> That's intimidating. Other thing we need to pay attention to is things like runway lengths. Uh, we know in advance already the wind is going to be coming more or less from 250, so we know we're going to be dealing with about 6,300 feet of runway, which is going to be important. Uh, taking a look at fuel, uh, we notice we're going to have plenty of fuel options. Uh, we can see the different lighting options if we need it. Uh, we have noise abatement procedures, which is something we have to find out about, uh, which is sort of a pain. Um, in the flight simulator, you don't care about noise abatement, you just turn your volume down. In the real world, people get pretty grumpy when you fly airplanes over the house. It's just kind of that thing. Uh, remarks, uh, it's a continuous uh, attendant, which means it is a towered airport. In case you're curious, we have a bunch of warnings about high-speed military jets, helicopters, air station Cape Cod. We have the critical weather information, which we're definitely going to need a little bit later on. We also have things like the tower, ground control, clearance delivery. I know we're going to need clearance delivery later, if uh, you don't know. We can, of course, call the phone and all these different things. The important things, though, is my remarks suggest that there's nothing weird going on here. Now, we are non-commercial aircraft, so that means we have to pay the 17 bucks or whatever it is. So I'm not going to worry about that too, too much. But we know that the airport's all set and ready to rock. Next thing, uh, does it have fuel? Yes. Control tower? Yes. Runway lights? It does. And if it's closed, we can turn them on. Uh, restrictions? Uh, there's noise abatement in effect. So that's something we're going to have to think of. No TAMs. All right. Let's see what we got as far as no TAMs goes. Yep, 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 yep. I know. I know them search. Here we go. So let's go ahead and type in where we're going. CAC. There it is right there. Search. All right. Let's see what we got here. So we know we have uh, two permanent constructions going on. Uh, we can take a look at the little uh, NOTAM itself. Oh, <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, we know that taxiway F is closed aircraft that are heavy. That's not our problem. Uh, radio altimeter is unreliable. This is because of 5G. It basically made radio altimeters stop working in the real world. Again, a big flight simulated difference. Uh, taxiway F is closed. Now taxiway G, uh, let's see here. Between these times, that makes sense because it's close to a neighborhood. Uh, let's see here. Uh, that's not our problem. We have an initial approach fix, not our problem. This is all going to be VFR today. We have an obstacle that's an antenna. Runway 6, okay, runway threshold, okay, it's been modified. We have runway 12 and 3-0 are going to be closed between these times. So it looks like they're closed all morning. Interesting, good to know. Fortunately, this will not affect us, so I'm not worried about it. Uh, we have some warnings about the runway being out of service. Uh, that happens. We have a navigational aid, runway 24 a localizer. It's going to be out of service then. Yikes. That's not our problem. Like I said, we're not doing that. Oh, we've got some warnings about lightings in here. We have some stuff about the VR DME not working. And we have a warning that there's a lot of people goofing around this time of year, which doesn't surprise me. One of the cool things is you can actually open up the map like this, and what they'll do is they'll show you like little dots that allows you to see exactly where like all the boo-boos and things are. So in this case, I've just got my things uh, turned on here, and um, I don't really see a lot going on. But uh, like I said, it's part of the fun, part of the fun. All right, so I've confirmed that. I'm pretty happy about the NOTAMs today. Again, this could change if, you know, the Vice President of the United States decided to go visit it. Um, we're busted. All right, choosing route. This is the hard part. 
what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to pick out an altitude that makes it easy to see without smacking into clouds. Now, if we pop over to our sky vector real quick, I see all these uh, funky circles and colors and everything like that. We notice that the airspaces around us are going to have specific cloud requirements. So before we even joke about, oh, how high can we go? We need to be thinking about making sure we don't smack into a cloud because there's got to be visual flight rules. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and draw the first line here. Again, I'd already done this on, with my little red Sharpie on the actual paper one, but it's always good to see it digitally as well. And what am I crossing through? Well, we're passing through a delta airspace. That's a 531, 500 feet below. So we got to keep that in mind. We need to be at least 500 clearance here. This whole region is all echo airspace. There's a little bit of what I call the high ceiling echo, but that doesn't affect us. It's all going to be echo airspace. Echo, echo, echo. It looks like we're just going to nip some delta here because of this, uh, I believe this is Quonset State. Yep. Keep going, keep going. We're going to go past Cutty Hunk. We're going to go over Martha's Vineyard. That's also going to be Delta Airspace. That's 531 again. But again, this is all Echo still, so I'm not worried about it too much. I don't think we're passing through any warning zones. No, we're good. So we're going to keep cruising, keep cruising, keep cruising. We're going to go smacking right into some Delta over here. So it looks like three nautical mile visibility is our minimum. 500 feet below the clouds is also our minimum. Now, here's where things get a little tricky. And this is uh, when I try to do a little bit of a research in advance when I can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the weather here. I'll just kind of experiment. I've got a new shore ham. We'll go ahead and pick a point right in the middle. That looks pretty good right there. We'll go ahead and pop this sucker open down below. And we'll go see. Obviously, we can't fly today. Oh, look at the wind. We'll go take a look at uh, weather for that particular day when we expect to be flying. It's about 10 a.m. And we'll go ahead and flip over the mediagram, which is going to be a little bit easier to read. And we can see that the clouds are, oh boy, 18,000. So we're basically not limited in the slightest by clouds here, which is awesome. It means we can take advantage of nice strong tailwinds because typically in our area, the wind comes from the west. Okay, so that checks that. Uh, can we get over obstacles? Sure. Uh, check my hearts that are 5 to 10 nautical miles. We'll deal with that in a second. Indirect and plot out on VFR. All right, let's do it. So the first problem we're going to have, and this is an interesting one, is whatever altitude we select is going to dictate what our first waypoint is. You're probably saying, no, your first waypoint would be based on what you can see. Well, the problem is the aircraft doesn't start at its cruise altitude. It actually takes a substantial amount of time, especially in an older plane, like uh, this lovely beast that is the Cessna 172 uh, Mike, which is going to be the one that would be flying around it. Because of that, we know that we can't just wee and just go. We have to actually calculate where we're going to end up hitting that particular point. So before we do that, we almost have to go uh, do some recursive thinking here. Let's play with some altitudes. So we know my cruise speed is going to be about 116. Call that about a guess. It's not going to be 116 in the real plane. It'll be like 108 on a good day. And I can see that this is going to take us about 48 minutes. But unfortunately, it's for the wrong date. So let's go ahead and uh, dial this in. We'll expect 11 o'clock in the morning. We'll expect this will be uh, Tuesday. I think that's pretty fair. So that gives us a 48 minutes. So let's go ahead and pop up to 35, which would be the first minimum altitude. Remember, we're traveling east, so we need to make sure we include an altitude that is odd, plus 500. So we get 56 minutes. If we go to 55, 55 minutes. If we go to 75, 54 minutes. Holy smokes, we found ourselves in altitude. Now, you're probably saying, yeah, 75,000 feet, sure. Um, 7,500, rather. That's actually a good thing. On a Cessna 172, uh, you get 1.5 nautical miles per 1,000 feet. So if we take 1.5 times 1,000, uh, that's going to get you 1,500, uh, 7,500 divided by, whoop, hold on, I'm going to clean that up just a little bit, 7,500 uh, divided by 1,000 times 1 1.5 gives me 11.25 of gliding miles in the event that we have an engine out at that altitude. What does that mean for us? That means that this gap right here, let's go ahead and measure it real quick. This would be the point of not having a good day. Yeah, pretty confident it's about three nautical miles. We'd be fine. Uh, crossing this gap here, uh, we should probably measure that real fast. Double check. Remember, the rule states that you have to be within gliding distance of some ground. So if we put those two together, this is 12 miles. Yeah. So even if we had an engine out here, we'd have six miles in both directions. We could still land at 7,500 feet. So we're good. So uh, we passed that check as well. Um, you're probably going, oh, yeah, so let's do 7,500. You go zoom, zoom. I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to come in at 5,500 feet. And you're going, well, but you just said that 7,500 is going to be great. You're going to be above all these airspaces. You're going to have plenty of wiggly room down here and all that. The reason I'm not going to do that is because this is a VFR pilotage flight. The reason that I wouldn't go that high immediately is because to get to that distance is going to require a substantial amount of time. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at this uh, sideways and uh, hopefully it doesn't hurt your neck too much, if I'm going from sea level to 7,500 feet, if I go across, that is going to take 17 minutes out of a 56-minute flight to get there, which means I'm spending so much time climbing when I can't see out the window. Look at how many nautical miles it takes. 
It's 22 nautical miles to get to that altitude. So even though the optimum altitude seems great, it actually does not work for us at all because of how high this is. So for this particular flight, I'm actually going to go to 55. And I would even argue 55 might be a little bit on the high side as well. But at least we're still going to be able to safely uh, coast the land in the event that we have an engine out over water. I just don't feel like bringing a flare pistol with me. Okay, so we've selected that. So now we need to figure out what our top of climb point is going to be. Now, like I said, this gets kind of tricky. Let me rotate this a couple times. And keep in mind, the numbers here are not the numbers in the actual plane. Uh, you'd be aligned to yourself if you think the numbers ever agree with each other. So we know if we're going up to 5,500, it's going to take us, let's see here, about 73 knots, uh, about 73 and a half knots. This says it's going to take about 13 nautical miles. It's not going to take 13 nautical miles. That's with no wind. And also, don't forget if our temperature increases or comes down, which will be the case, that will also be modified. Nobody said that this would be easy, right? So here's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to calculate our average speed and use that and integrate it in order to figure out what our climb position is going to be. So let's see here. Uh, 73 plus 74 plus 75 plus, plus whoa, minus 222. Ah, let's try that again. 78 plus 77 plus 76 plus, oh my gosh, 78 plus 77 plus 76 plus 75 plus 74 plus 73 plus 72. Now we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 divided by 7 will give us an average speed of 75 knots. Sweet. That's a great news. That also means when I come over here and dial this in to top of climb, we know that my airspeed is going to be 75. Sweet. That's a good number. We need to know that. So how much distance is it going to take me to travel 75 knots? Well, remember this wind. And not only is there wind, but if we actually confirm it, we can probably see how ridiculously strong that wind actually is. So if I pop this up real quick, it looks like my average wind here for my cruise is going to be 264 at 25, which means if I come in here and do 264 at 65 knots, oh, we should probably put in our course and route real fast here. That'd be silly if I didn't do it. Let's see, uh, 103 true is going to be our true course, and it's going to be 5,500 feet. So we know that this distance is an unknown quantity, but we know that we're traveling 75 knots for as many minutes as it's going to take us to get up to altitude. That's everything we need to know, because now we can come back here. We know to get to that altitude is going to take us about 10 and a half minutes. 10 and a half minutes at 75 knots will give us our distance. So let's do this. 10.5 divided by 60 times 75. 13.125 miles. That is how far it takes to get to our first position, which is going to be, like I said, our top of our climb with wind. Now you're immediately going, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. The uh, wind velocity you have there is absolutely incorrect. You, know, you didn't do that number correctly. You might want to come back and fix that one. I'll be like, yeah, you're actually completely right on that one. I can't believe I accidentally. It's just difficult to type when you can't see the keyboard. Trust me on that one. So uh, two five, two five. Let's go fix that. Ah, uh, all fixed. Fortunately, it didn't affect our distance. It only affects um, this little goofy number over here. So now we're looking a little good. Uh, temperature's good. Now, the next thing you're going to say is, wait, 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 wait. But the wind is in 25 knots at lower altitudes. You're completely correct again. So as you probably predicted, um, none of this works yet. So we have to actually take the average speed of the whole flight on our way up. Since we know it's 25 knots at 5,500 and it's about 8 knots, so if we were to take the average of that, 8 plus, let's call it uh, 25 plus 8, 8 divided by 2 is going to give us about 16.5 is going to be our overall. So let's call it 17. So now we know our ground speed. We know our ground speed. We actually have to come back and readjust this value. I did not say this would be easy. I actually said this would be quite a process, which is why I'm going to break into multiple values. So let's do it again. We know that we're going uh, a total of, uh, what was that? I believe 11 minutes, correct? So we'll come over here. I believe we did that a minute ago. Uh, 5,500 will be, uh, let's see, let's call it 10 and a half minutes. So 10 and a half minutes divided by 60 times 91 is 15.925 miles. So 15.9. <sighs> so now we know our first waypoint, which is our top of our climb. So we know that somewhere along this line, about 50 nautical miles in, which probably, if I had to guesstimate real quick, is going to work out to be about there. Oh, we know that our first point is actually going to be probably about there. Let's try that. And let's go ahead and delete that one. Let's go ahead and pop that one right there. Yeah, there it is. So believe it or not, our top of climb is actually probably going to be our first waypoint, which is going to be this nice little set of power lines that's going to be along here. This is where the aircraft is actually going to cap out at. 
Now, I know you're sitting there going, that's a really long distance for a climb. And that's what I was warning everybody about. We could do a half climb position, which is a, something I've done many times before. So what we're probably going to have to do is make our first waypoint in here because we're going to have to say, hey, wait a minute. We know there's a couple of little lakes and rivers down here. We also know this is where the power lines start. So this is going to have to be a situation where our first waypoint comes before we get to our altitude. And that makes it even more mathematically complicated for us, which is too bad because, you know, that's part of the fun. So our TOC is actually also not accurate because we need something between that because we will have traveled too darn far. So we'll do power lines. Oop, helps if you spell power lines, right? Slash, and we'll go ahead and call this a lake on left. Sweet. So obviously this is going, whoa, helps if you spell the word left there. Power lines, lake on left. Delightful. And we know we're not going to be up to that altitude. We're going to put it in anyway. Our course and route is not going to have changed. But this wind speed and velocity actually needs to be halved again. 17 plus 8 divided by 2 is going to be an average of 13. Oh my! Nobody said this would be easy. Everybody said this would be pretty difficult. So we're now going to have to go up to there and recalculate that part. So 13 plus 28 divided by two is going to give us a 21 average speed, but the um, total climb speed is not going to change, which also means this number is no longer valid because we've gone too high. We're going to say TOC clash lakes on left. Oh my gosh. But you can see how much of an impact that does to our flight. If this were 7,500 feet, we'd be like 20 miles away before we got here. By the way, if you're wondering where I got the number 14 when I did this, it's on account of the fact that if we zoom out, the isogonic line right here, which is the one that tells us our magnetic deviation, is a big old 14W, always add W, subtract Es. So we're good to go. So now we know that this distance is actually a little bit closer to half, which is actually not terrible. So if we did 15.9 uh, divided by two, that's gonna give me an eight nautical miles to the first, and it's going to be, uh, let's see, eight uh, uh, times two minus eight is gonna be 7.9 for the second leg. <sighs> good, nice. Cool, we're getting somewhere. Delightful. So what we've done so far is I've basically calculated this extremely tricky point, which is where the aircraft is going to cap out at, which by a very convenient point, if you actually look on both sides, this is Columbia, Connecticut, we actually have a lot of lakes on the right, we have a lot of lakes, and we have these power lines we can probably follow. There's also this airport called Wyndham, which is not too, too far out. So we have our first two points. I'm actually going to delete this point. You're probably saying, hey, why'd you delete it? I'll show you, because if you actually use Sky Vector for this, it'll calculate your top of climb for you. So keep that in mind. All right, so we have our top of climb, which is going to be right here. Our next waypoint, I'm going to go ahead and take Wyndham Airport, which is going to be off our left wing right here. Go ahead and click right there. I'll click that like that. So that's going to be, it looks like a really big jump, but it actually isn't a big jump. So we're going to do Kijid, which is a Wyndham Airport. Whoa, that's a totally different airport. Kijid, like I said, can't see. 5500, 103. Now we can use our true cruise wind here of 28. And we know that our cruise speed is going to be 116. Now, you're probably going, oh, aren't you getting a little ahead of yourself there? I'm like, eh, not really. But uh, the one thing we do want to do is confirm that this distance is accurate. So I'm going to go back to my plan. Like I said, this is kind of a pain in the butt. So we know that our total distance so far, let's grab my little calculator for the 50th time here. Nobody said this would be easy. 8.1 plus 12.6, that's 20.7 minus the distance it took us to get to the top of climb, minus 8, minus 7.9 minus eight minus 7.9, which is 4.8 nautical miles. So that's actually a really, really short hop to that next waypoint. So it's actually, we could probably leave it the same, but let's not, let's not get goofy, let's not get goofy. Okay, now we're, whew, now we're getting somewhere. Let's do it. So my next waypoint, I'm gonna pick Jewett City here. There's a very, very large lake. It'd be very visible, not to mention this town is gigantic and there's a big lake going through the middle of it. So let's go make a quick little note there, just to keep our sanity here. So that's, uh, what do we have here? A total distance of 10 nautical miles, I like that. So temperature zero, uh, we got a total distance of 10 nautical miles. So Kijit to, uh, uh, that's really new, uh, Jewett City, 5,500, 103. This isn't going to change the whole flight, I expect. Uh, 264, 28, uh, 116 is going to be our cruise speed. I'll show you where I got that in a minute. Uh, now our new distance, uh, like we just said a few moments ago, is going to be 10 nautical miles. Perfect. Cool. Moving along. So now we're going to go from Jewett City. Uh, we're going to go to Beach Pond. There's this neat, <laughs> this is such an easy lake to find. And also it's a big flag icon, which is a reporting point. So this works out really well for us. Looks like uh, we've got a new distance here of 8.6 nautical miles. So we'll do 8.6. Uh, none of this is going to change. Uh, what do they call it? Beach Pond? What a redundant name in my mind. <laughs> I don't know. It just bothers me. Let's go double check the wind. But um, let's, I think it should be roughly the same as what it was before. But just for sanity's purposes, let's go check it out again. For the 50th time, keep in mind the winds are all going to be wrong by the time we get to the actual flight. 
So let's see, a user fix. The next one is 263 at 25. Uh, that's why we checked it. 263 at 25. We're still doing 116. Magnetic deviation has not changed. All right, here, we're going to go now to the next spot. Uh, we have Richmond Airport, which is going to be off our right wing. I'm going to click right there. We'll see what that is for a distance. Uh, distance is going to work out to be a 9.2 nautical miles. It's perfect. 9.2. Uh, this is going to stay the same. This is the same. 263 at 25. I don't know what the temperature is actually going to be, but this fine. 116, 14 magnetic deviation. So far, so good. So uh, we've got that part. Uh, obviously, this that's another reporting point. Also, this bridge is so freaking obvious. It's unbelievable. So I'm going to actually click right here. I'll use this as my next waypoint. I'm going to calculate the distance. New distance is going to be 11.5 nautical miles, which isn't bad. So beach pond to big bridge. Big bridges, that's very specific. I know, 103. Uh, 263 at 25. Again, we'll check that in a minute to see if I'm accurate. 14. Um, let's see here. I forgot to enter speed. 116. Delightful. So now we're going to get to the sketchy part. We're going to want one more waypoint before we cross. And that's going to be that point right here where that little cove is. Uh, that's going to give me a distance of 8.6 again, or 8.6 again. That makes no sense. And this is how you get confused. Let's see here. Uh, that was, um, uh oh, 11.5. 11.5. Yep, that was correct. Uh, coast. Confused myself. Don't do that. Let's see here. We're going to do 8.6. Like I said, nobody said this would be easy, but I will be thorough. And this is exactly how we do it in the real world. 263 at 25, 116 stays at 14. Now, doing this by hand, by the way, takes about two hours. <laughs> As you could probably imagine. All right, so we hit the coast. Uh, that's a metal 8.6. I'm going to confirm that, 8.6. Uh, actually, we're off by an entire list here because that should be that one. We'll go confirm this in just a second because to get to the coast should be this. So uh, we definitely missed something. Uh, big bridges would be here. Uh, Richmond. APT. Like I said, you got to double check it about a million times. 5,500. Whoa. 103. And now we need to go confirm what the next leg is going to be here. So we're going to go from the coast to uh, Cuddyhunk Island, which is going to be right here. It's a little tiny kind of... Uh, little seaplane place. Uh, that's going to be a distance of 10.9 nautical miles. 10.9 nautical miles. That's going to get us to Cuddy Hunk uh, Island. Pretty cool. Uh, 26325. I'm sure it's not actually going to be that, but we want to go confirm it in a minute. 14 looks good. Cuddy Hunk is good. Nobody said this would be easy. Yes, it says Cut Hunk, but oh well. We're going to cruise now over to Nantucket. Uh, actually, this is Martha's Vineyard. This is a perfectly fine waypoint because it's in the middle of the island. You literally can't miss it. Unfortunately, it's 14.4 nautical miles to get to that point, which is um, not good. So this is going to KMVY. Again, the altitude will have not changed. Our, this direction will not have changed. Our winds probably will, but we'll check confirm that in a minute. 116, we'll go to work to 14. There's no uh, compass issues here. So Kamivi, uh, so from Kamivi, I think we have two more waypoints. We have Muskeget Island, which is going to be the one that's located right here. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. It's going to be right off our left wing. Uh, that's another long leg here of 12.2, which is usually not recommended, but you got to do what you got to do. 103. Again, I don't like flying over water because it's kind of dangerous. Also, you need special rules for flying over water as well. Um, island on left. Cool. So now we're going to go ahead and get our last point, and that's going to take us right to CAC. K A C K. Nice. We're going to go 5,500 again. 103, 263 at 25. We're going to confirm that in a minute. We're going to come down here. We're going to do zero, zero. We're going to assume this is 14. And that's going to be whatever we have left of our flight plan here. So this is at 12 nautical miles, but it's actually 12.2 nautical miles, 12.2. Oh, interesting. We have two sets of 12.2s, which means I made a mistake. Now let's confirm that. Yes, because it was 14.1, then it was 12.2. And that's why we confirm it. 14.1. 12.2. Excellent. We got it. Woo! Man, that's a lot. I'm glad this thing calculates for me. And like I said, I will provide a link for those of you who want to play with this because this works pretty darn well. So there is my flight. So we take off from Hartford. We uh, grab some power lines that'll be on our left plus a lake. Um, we're going to follow the power lines until we see a bunch of lakes on the left. We'll hit the top of our climb. We're going to see Wyndham, Jewett City. We're going to see a beach pond, Richmond Airport, big bridges. We're going to hit the coast, Cuttyhunk Island. We're going to hit Kamivi. We're going to have an island on the left and we're going to reach all the way out to Nantucket. Wow. So this is, like I said, a blitz. Uh, even with electronic tools, this still took me 25 minutes to bang through. And I know where I'm going. You know, when you're in situations where you have like a six, 700 mile flight, obviously you need you know, nine or 10 pages of this, which <laughs> gets a little excessive. Now you're probably saying, oh, we're done, right? It's like, mm, 
No, there's actually a lot more we have to still have to do here. So um, we're actually going to save that for the next video when we take a look at things like weight and balance, which is going to make sure that we can safely actually fly this plane without, you know, having issues with center of gravity. And we're also going to have to calculate the performance, which uh, there's quite a bit to it. Like I said, I'm estimating with the 16 knots. We're going to have to make this another recursive project uh, process where we're going to have to go back recalculate everything that we've had so far and then come forward again and make sure by the way if you're looking for the manual uh, you just type in the name of the airplane you're interested in type in poh afterwards and that's going to do it let's go double check my little plane here i haven't done anything for weather i haven't done anything for performance yet so you can see we still have a little ways to go and then we still got to fly the darn thing but other than that enjoy